Welcome, Scott. Um, Scott has been in a leadership role for um, last many years. He, you, you was at the corporate education at Apollo Education as a vice president, and then uh, you joined this company, Communist Fund, who is uh, specialized in the communication related, uh, communication skill related podcast. And you've been there as a pres president for four years, uh, six months almost. <laughs> um, so with that, I want to give you an opportunity to share with the audience what you do and how you can help uh, help them and how they can reach out to you. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here and for the opportunity to talk a little bit about Communispond. As you mentioned, I've been there for about four and a half years. About six months ago, I moved into the presidency role, really taking over strategic leadership for the organization. Communispond was founded in 1969, really to help business professionals communicate more effectively. We offer a wide variety of solutions for individuals and corporations, but it really all focuses around communication skills, whether it is how you can have a more effective dialogue with your colleagues or standing in front of a large group giving a presentation, all the way down to writing skills, how to be more effective with email, documents that you have to put out. So if you think about the world of communication in the corporate setting, Communispond has solutions that are able to help people really take those skills to the next level, give them ample opportunity to practice and drive behavioral change. And as I mentioned, we offer one-to-one -one coaching for individuals, corporate programs for larger groups, or if somebody just simply wants to take advantage of one of our classes, we do offer an open enrollment schedule where they can purchase a single seat. So if you know, folks have questions about it afterwards, they can find me on LinkedIn uh, with Scott D'Amico. And I will add all the hyperlink in the show note. And one other thing that we discussed, you, your company is engaged with Advent Health as well for one of the executive prisons program that I wanted to join. So um, they will have another batch, which I will join. So again, yeah, thank that's, you that's for very that. Very exciting. Yeah, we really, really appreciate our partnership there. What you wanted to become when you was high school? For me, as I thought about it and really thought back to, to my time in, in high school, which is seeming, gosh, longer and longer ago uh, every day. But you know, initially just when I was in high school, my initial thought was, okay, I'm going to go to college. I'm going to play football in college. I was really sports minded in school. I did well academically, but I was really excited and passionate about sports. But yeah, I realized those dreams were mm -hmm. going to be relatively short-lived. I wasn't going to play in the NFL or things like that. Uh, but one of the things initially that did interest me was in the criminal justice space, potentially going on to be an FBI agent. Uh, so as I thought about that, did more research, talked with different guidance counselors at the school, learn more about the profession. I just, I learned there's one, a lot more that goes into it than maybe what you see on TV with all the high profile and excitement of the job, uh, as well as what people are typically doing to get to that point. It's not as if you go out, go through some quick training and become an FBI agent. Uh, so after doing that, I shifted gears a little bit and mm -hmm. decided ultimately to go into education. And there were just a couple of things throughout my life that brought me to that point. The first one being is you know, the, the area I grew up in, in Ohio, was once dominated by the steel and the auto industry. It was a flourishing town, great economic growth, lots of jobs, lots of employment security, great community. But as I was growing up, those markets were in decline, the jobs were going away, the economy was shrinking. And as my parents saw that, you know, they saw what was happening to the community, and so for both me and my brother, they always stressed the importance of mm -hmm. education you know, to help kind of just protect your lively, livelihood, protect your just safety and security and planning, focus in on education. So growing up for me, my brother, school was always very important. It was always just this mindset that we were going to go to college. It wasn't mm -hmm. if we were going to go to college, it was hey. when we go to college. So that, that stuck with me. And so I always valued education and saw the importance of it. And that's really what led me down the path to go to school for an education degree and start my career 
as a high school teacher. I taught primarily civics and economics, really enjoyed it. I had a, you know, a lot of fun and just really a lot of impact with my students and being able to see that personal and educational growth with them. Mm -hmm. But it, it started to get to a point, especially working in a, a very large district and a large school where teaching started to become secondary. And for me, that was someone that was so passionate about education and the impact that you can have with that, mm -hmm. I was finding myself continuously being pulled away from that focus with paperwork, meetings for the sake of meetings, it, being in a large school, having to deal with a lot of disciplinary issues. Mm -hmm. As I realized teaching starting to become secondary, I realized, okay, maybe this isn't the best long-term path for me. Mm -hmm. And I started to think about how can I leverage the transferable skills that I have into another career that is still in this education space that's going to focus on how do you help people or how can people change their lives or change their path through education. Mm -hmm. That's what brought me to Apollo focusing in on corporate education and also for me, as I was teaching, one of the things that, that I realized was, and that I was looking for my next opportunity was a connection between the work that I'm doing and the impact that I'm having and kind of my own personal and career outcomes. And as I was teaching, as I mentioned, I was having a lot of great success, really connecting with the students, seeing that growth, changing a lot of kids, right, in their lives. Mm -hmm. And next door to me would be a teacher that's maybe been there for 25 years that's phoning it in, not really caring. Kids are constantly getting in trouble in that class and they're making the same amount as me or likely probably making a lot more than me simply because they've been there for a long time and they really weren't doing it or putting in the work or making an effort. So me, I was looking for a way to find an opportunity really where that was that connection. And that's why I found it in that corporate education space to build relationships with organizations mm -hmm. around how do they leverage their tuition assistance dollars to fill the talent or skills gaps that they're facing, how they focus on retaining employees with education and customized training programs. So I spent a little over a decade there, grew from an individual contributor uh, up into, as you mentioned, leading the corporate sales team when I left. And when I hit that 10 year mark, mm -hmm. it was similar to when I was teaching. There was this, this point of inflection, kind of a time for reflection, especially a decade at the same mm -hmm. organization. I started to think about, well, you know, what did I want to accomplish when I came here? What have I accomplished? What's left to do? And at that point, I realized maybe it's time to, to move on and start looking for a new opportunity. And just like before, I started to dig into, okay, what's going to be important mm -hmm. for my next move, the next play? Very similar. I wanted to stay in the education and training space because it's something that I know. I had a strong network there and was really passionate about. I wanted to be somewhere where I can make an impact and there's going to be a connection to my outcomes from that impact. And then I was wanting to look at a smaller organization where I could come in and, and move pretty quickly and then really wanted to find something that mm -hmm. I was passionate about and really believed in. So for me, being at a mission-driven organization, having a product or solution that I believe in is important. And I've been lucky to have that throughout my career between teaching and the corporate mm -hmm. education space and now what I'm doing with Communispawn. So, and, and here I am today, uh, looking forward to every minute of it. Quite a journey, right? It, it's been, it's been quite a journey. It's been fun. It's been exciting. There definitely, I don't want to sugarcoat it, been bumps in the road, setbacks mm -hmm. along the way, you know, but for me, maintaining that focus of really what's important for the roles and organizations that I'm looking at uh, has definitely helped. And Scott, when you was an individual contributor or even in the manager role um, in uh, Apollo education and becoming a vice president, what was the biggest difference between the two roles? So I would say the, the biggest difference between the two roles of that individual contributor and moving into to management, you know, senior leadership within the organization is when you're in that, that individual contributor role, you really are just focused kind of on you, right? Okay, I have mm -hmm. what I need to do. I have my task ahead of me. Some will kind of go here, but for me, I would always try and open that aperture a little bit 
And I think that's what helped me to move into some mm-hmm. of the, the leadership roles is that while I was really focused on my task at hand and what I needed to do, I was constantly looking for how can we make things better, not only for myself, but for other people within the team, within the organization. So from moving from the individual contributor up to a manager and above, the mindset shift has to be, okay, it's not about me anymore. It's mm-hmm. about my team. What can I do to make sure that the people on my team are going to be successful? Mm-hmm. And a big part of that is comes down to communication, dialoguing with them, and really understanding for each individual on that team or within the group, what's important to them? What motivates them? It, for some people, mm-hmm. it's money. Some people, it's job security. Some people, it is having very clear black and white directions to move forward with. And so as you start to learn and work with your team, you understand what's most important to them. And it helps you to kind of lead and coach those folks as individuals Mm -hmm. to achieve uh, their optimal outcome. That's an amazing answer and uh, amazing perspective. And uh, I went through the same journey. And when I was an individual contributor, I was proud of uh, whatever I was developing, whether it is a program or architect or whatever it was. I look back last five years, 10 years, and see the individual that I was able to contribute to their career growth or life in general. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, it is. It's, it's moving into those leadership positions when you're moving into it for the right reasons. Some people want it because they're going to get a fancier title. Some people are going to mm-hmm. want it because maybe they're going to get a pay bump. But for me, especially coming from the the teaching background where I was there to help other people grow. When I was in the individual contributor role, very quickly, I was itching to get into the manager role, the leadership role, because I really just wanted to continue to help people grow. That's just from my Mm -hmm. perspective, that's something I'm really passionate about. I really enjoy doing. So let's say if you're getting into people leadership for the right reason, it is so fulfilling and just so exciting. Did you also go to the director role or directly to the VP? Yeah. So I think once you, the the idea of leading yourself, leading teams, then leading people managers, so to speak, Mm -hmm. it's just a slight shift in the coaching mindset. So if you're a director or vice president and you're leading people who are leading other people, Mm -hmm. it just, once again, goes down to, to motivation and then understanding what that person's role is. So if there's a manager on the team, it's you know, understanding that their role is really about developing their people. So you need to really work to equip them with the skills to, to be able to develop other people, which is, it's, it's a challenging nuance to that. Then as mm-hmm. you can tend to get higher in the organization, from there, you have to start to incorporate a little bit more big picture thinking and to just, you know, the strategy, the goals, where we're going to be six months, six years, whatever from now. So as you continue to move on, for me, the prior mindset of developing people always has to stay there. I think some Mm -hmm. of the most effective leaders out there, whether they're leading a 50 employee company or a 50,000 employee company or bigger, they're folks that still focus on developing the people on their team, whether that's a senior vice president that's reporting to them or a manager reporting to them really is how do you develop people to equip them with the skills that they need to do their job best. Cool. So we spend some good amount of time on this topic. So uh, you had a stable job by then. You, you've been into this role for 10 years and you decided to change. Mm-hmm. What was the decision process? How, how, how long it took for you to decide that to come to the point that I want to make a change. And then you found, I guess, this new opportunity after that. Yeah. So it was one of those things where just the timing was right. The stars somewhat aligned to Mm -hmm. right when I hit that decade mark, 10 years for me, that's a big career milestone to be somewhere for, for 10 years, same organization, same employer for 10 years, uh, granted at a lot of different roles, a lot of twists and turns along the way. But so when I hit that 10 years, I start thinking about, okay, you know, is this, do I see maybe long-term here? Is this going to be, you know, 30 years retire, get the gold watch from here? Or do I want to do something different? And, you know, at that point, I was just ready for a change. We had gone through, you know, at Apollo, just a number of 
changes due to the increasing competitive landscape, what was going on with online learning and training at the time. So we've been through a lot. And just for me, I was ready for a change. So I started thinking about, you know, if I were to leave, what would that next opportunity need to look like? So I, you know, jotted down a handful of things that really would be like, okay, if I, if I find this, Mm -hmm. I would make the jump. I, I would go for a new opportunity. And as I was going through that process, I was approached by a couple of different opportunities very different uh, in the, say, I would say the type of organization that they were still both within the training and education space. Mm -hmm. Uh, But as I started to look, look and evaluate really what I wanted, what I was looking for, where I felt I would have the biggest impact and quite honestly be the happiest, Communispawn just checked all those boxes. So for Mm -hmm. me, it was a no brainer to make the move. And here you not only this president, you, you're responsible for a strategy, uh, marketing. On top of that, you do your own podcast as well for them. See? Yeah, so I've been been busy for the, for the past six months or so. And I will say I am just so fortunate at Communispawn to have a very strong and tenured team, you know, you know, a colleague who leads our product and services, people that run logistics, mm-hmm. instructional designers, our public programs, a fantastic sales team, marketing. When you have a great team in place, it frees you up to be able to do some of mm-hmm. the, the other things. That otherwise, if you're constantly putting out fires or dealing with issues or feeling like you have to do everything, it's challenging to do. So having this great team in place has enabled me to once really spend time thinking about the business, you know, what's next, where are we going, things like that. But then also to do other initiatives such as the podcast with Communicast, mm-hmm. really starting to think about and just going back to my passion around helping people, you know, what is an additional avenue that we can use to get out mm-hmm. tips and strategies for this area of communication skills that is just so important. If you right. real honest, if you think about communication, it's the, the foundation or bedrock for all that we do in our personal and professional lives. And it cuts across every industry. So what's an additional avenue that we can take to get more resources out to folks in addition to the blogs that we write, videos we put out, strategies, uh, everything that we share started to look at, you know, this idea of audio being so Mm -hmm. On such a growth trajectory, there's so much going on right now in the the audio space when it just comes to to businesses, the B2B space, B2C space, uh, with Clubhouse being a big component of it. Mm -hmm. Podcasting is growing exponentially every year. Uh, So it's just a natural fit for us to be able to bring this podcast out and start to then bring in outside voices. That was one of the big things as I thought about this was, you know what, we do a great job of sharing our voice and our strategies and our opinions with the market. Now I want to hear from, from other people. I want to hear from a training leader or human resources leader. I want to hear from consultants, executives at large fortune organizations, get their view as to what does it mean really to be a great communicator? Mm -hmm. What impact have those skills had on your career? And what can you share with the audience? Maybe some tips or strategies you've learned along the way uh, that have helped you get to where you are today. So it's been a, a really exciting journey. We launched a, um, about four months ago, four or five months ago. I've been had some really interesting guests so far and starting to mm-hmm. see some good traction with us. It's been fun. Have you done the podcast before or this is your first time? This was... Um, this is my second time being a guest on a podcast. And prior to launching Communicast, I was a guest one time. And that's okay. sort of what got me to do it. I had been thinking about it for a while, a little apprehensive for doing it. Mm-hmm. While I, from my teaching background and sales and leadership background, I'm comfortable getting up in front of a group and presenting, comfortable in a client meeting where I have like a framework and a structure where I can anticipate where things are going to go. But I was a little nervous about just this idea of getting somebody on and just carrying on with them for an extended period of time, not knowing where things may go. But I was fortunate to get invited on a podcast. I had a lot of fun, really enjoyed it, felt like it came out strong. 
And at that point is where uh, my marketing director kind of kicked me in the pants and said, all right, Scott, you, you can do this. Just give it a shot. Let's try it. Let's figure this out and let's go with it. And it's like I said, I'm happy that I did. And you know, I've shared recently several things that I've learned along the way. And one of the biggest things that has jumped out is that you can't wait until you know everything to do something. Had I waited until I knew everything about podcasting, I would still be waiting. There's just there's so mm-hmm. much that goes into it between audio and video editing. You know, uh, you, how do you how do you market it? Getting set up on all the distribution channels so it gets into Spotify yeah. and, and Apple Podcasts and iHeartMeet, all that stuff. If I just waited and tried to figure all that out, as I mentioned, we never would have started. So at some point you need to trust your gut and say, okay, I know enough. I can get started with this yeah. and then we'll continue to learn and grow along the way. 94% people or new podcasts drop out before they finish 10 episode. And I, I, mm-hmm. I've heard that 10 episode mark seems to be a big one. We have launched eight. Number nine goes out next Tuesday. And I think I have three or four already recorded and three or four more scheduled beyond that. So Perfect. Yes. You, you cross yes, I'll that. Make it. <laughs> and then the next mark is 21 episode. Uh, if you cross that, you are top 1%. I'm getting close to that. So that, that will be good. <laughs> and you know, over the past month, it's been pretty neat to see. We've been you know, weaving in and out of the uh, top 250 for Apple business management podcasts. So there seems to be an audience out there, an appetite for it. People are reacting to it. And as I mentioned, it's having a lot of fun with it. Nice. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm sure your marketing team does something to promote it. We do. So primarily, we put it out through our social media channels uh, with us having a B2B audience. LinkedIn Mm -hmm. is the primary channel where when it launches every other week, we put out little audiograms, short, you know, 60 to 90 second clips. Uh, uh, with a you know video graphic that's that circles on in the audio playback to give people a sample and then link to the site. We do that a couple times per week. Uh, in addition to that, you know, I put it out, my team puts it out through our LinkedIn pages, Twitter, YouTube, uh, and then also housed on our website and occasionally feature it in some of the emails that go out. And I think uh, uh, I I seen your YouTube channel as well, and uh, that's where I like to go. I like the mm-hmm. visual as well, uh, even though we, so what I do, I put this on YouTube as well as uh, distribute to all the Apple and everywhere, but I like this visual connection. Um, yeah. I feel like uh, that's where you can see the expression. I'm doing really good when, I, when I'm taking the interviews and all mm-hmm. and uh, connecting with the person. It feels so natural. I don't have to repeat or uh, edit there. But when I'm trying to record solo, it's really hard. And I'm sure that's a problem with many, many people are facing. So you being genius in this area, (laughs) what is your recommendation to people like me, as well as uh, whoever is watching this, how they do better in front of camera solo? Sure. Genius, I don't know. But yeah, definitely had some some experience with that. I appreciate that, though. So I, I think a lot of the skills are transferable. And so if it's something that you're looking to improve, whether it is simply just recording something through, through a camera that you're looking to post out on you know, your social media, your YouTube, maybe a three minute video, five minute video, whatever it may be. I do mm-hmm. a lot of that for our LinkedIn page, our LinkedIn content, whether it's that or whether it's just you're looking to improve those skills when you're standing in front of a live audience. Could be 500 people in an auditorium or five people on your team in a conference Mm -hmm. room or in a video conference, a lot of those skills are gonna carry over. A big part of that is quite honestly around practice. The the more reps you put in, just like with with sports or most things in life, as you practice, you'll start to see some progression. Mm -hmm. The thing that I always talk about though, is if you're practicing, but you really don't know what you should be doing or what you should be changing or specifically how to change it. That's a problem because, you know, I'm not a great golfer. I could go out and spend hours and hours and hours on the driving range, hitting bucket after bucket of balls. I'm still going to be shanking them all over the place because I don't have a coach there. 
I've never gone mm-hmm. and taken lessons. So I don't necessarily know, turn the club face, keep the arm straight, shift. I don't necessarily know what's wrong with my swing. So as you're practicing and maybe you identify, you know, I fidget a lot or I pace back and forth or I say, um, repeatedly, so something yeah. like that. Right? You, you can really identify that. So then it really is understanding what are the specific strategies or what are the specific trainings? How can I train myself to not do that? And you know, for, for Communispond, you know, a big thing that we teach is around using pauses. And a lot of people, you may pick up on it just in my cadence, the way that I speak is as I take a pause, slow myself down, it allows my brain to catch up a little bit to my mouth or vice versa. So that's going to help eliminate a lot of the ums, ahs, because typically that's just because you're moving so fast. Your brain hasn't caught up to where you're going. And in a live setting, you do that through uh, you making eye contact with folks. Mm-hmm. And some people just do this when they're speaking. They scan the room quite a bit and they, they just don't really stop or they're there. Then they're there. And as you're scanning a room, oftentimes it's going to be a bit of a blur versus if you start to make individual eye contact with one person, deliver a thought to them, then you move to the next person, deliver a thought to them. Now I'm over here talking to this person. Mm -hmm. Those pauses are where your brain catches up. It allows you to breathe and it's going to virtually eliminate those filler words. So you know, I'm over here. I have an odd. Uh, my name is Scott D'Amico. Today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Communispond and what we do. Three things that I hope that you take away from this speech today are ABC. Mm-hmm. So this idea of just kind of breaking it down, slowing yourself down. And quite honestly, people are uncomfortable with pauses, whether it's when they're speaking mm-hmm. they're on the phone. But if you use those pauses and use the eye brain control in there, make eye contact with people, deliver a thought, move on to the next person, deliver a thought. You would just, that right there, you will see a, a huge improvement in your public speaking present, presenting abilities. And back to your original point around video recording yourself. You know, say if you want to record mm-hmm. a video for social media or something like that. What I've found is the more scripted that my speech is going to be, the more I struggle with it. If I go through and try and memorize something, and then I go through and try to record it, as soon as I miss one word or change one word, my brain's like, oh my gosh, you messed yeah. that up. You, yeah. What are you doing? And then it's, it's hard to recover. So if you're going to do things like that, I think it's good to have an idea, good to have a framework for what you want to talk about. Maybe you have a general outline And then if you go through and do it and you use the power of the pause, Mm -hmm. you may not know exactly what's coming next, but if you just take a second to pause, it'll pop in there, then you move on. So that would be the the biggest thing is practice. And especially for video, don't over script it. Don't try to memorize it because as soon as you miss one little thing, it's just going to be all downhill from there. Thank you. You you are an expert. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. So in my case, uh, I have written about 161 article on medium.com. So I have a lot of content that I can convert into YouTube, whether these are book reviews or um, some of the articles on goal setting and uh, dreams and management, a lot of content there. I cannot do this script thing. Like, even though I have the written item, but I feel like if I try to read that, I even think about teleprompter so I can looking at the camera and reading but then it will be very hard to mix the expression with what I'm reading yes problem number one and then I cannot memorize so I think memorization is really hard for me because I went through your website your LinkedIn I still could not remember that (laughs) can you respond (laughs) <laughs> yeah, right. So the memorization is one of the weakest point that I have. So I could not remember the script and deliver. And when I try to not read the script and just go with the bullet point, 
these ums and ah, and then I have to repeat like take 10 retakes. So I think, I think with it, one, you definitely, when you're recording for social media, you have the power of editing. So you're able to splice together some, some takes that, that came out solid. Um, what I would think about would be, how do we take this article? I would just try to boil it down to the three or four things that I want the audience to know from this article that I wrote. Maybe it is about goal setting. Here are the three most important things when it comes to goal setting. Once you kind of identify, here's what I want the audience to, to take away from it, boil it down to three or four things that are manageable. And quite honestly, you can have, you know, notes in front of you. I have some notes that I jotted down for, for our conversation today where I'll, I can quickly glance. So if you boil it down, it allows you to simply talk through it versus, as you mentioned, trying to read it or to do it from memorization. The other component can simply be to try to incorporate visuals. So if you were to have over your shoulder, maybe it is like a, an image or even hanging on your wall behind you with the three mm -hmm. or four things that you're going to want to talk about, we teach strategies for how do you use your visual without talking to the visual. And I'm sure a lot of, oh. you've probably seen this before, a lot of people listening have seen this where somebody's presenting and they're turning around and they're just talking to the screen the entire time. And then they turn back as they're trailing off and finishing their sentence. So we teach this idea of what you want to do. You want to look, come back in silence, and then talk about that point. Then you can go back, find point number two, come back, tell us what point number two is. So it's okay to, to leverage visual, visuals. You just want to make sure that you're not talking to those visuals. Mm -hmm. So it simply could be something on the wall behind you, uh, or it could be a graphic that you are popping up in your video. That's a great suggestion. All, All right. right. So I'll, be, I'll be on the lookout for your next, next video. See if you incorporate that. <laughs> you will hold me accountable. Yes, I will absolutely. deliver it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, that was a great discussion. So let's move forward with mm -hmm. the next segment, which is how do you identify your dreams and mm -hmm. goals? And what's your goal setting method? Yeah. So really, when it comes to just kind of the, the general broader dreams, for me, it goes down to my motivation. And for me, day in and day out, my motivation is my family. It's my wife and my, my two kids. Mm -hmm. And so I just think about whether it is where I want to take my career professionally so that it gives me great work-life balance so that I can enjoy my time with the family. Do I want to figure out where it can take me financially so that I can provide for the family, roof over the head, food in the tummy, things like that, and then all the bonus things beyond that? So really, I start to look at it from a motivation standpoint. You know, Every day, my motivation is my family. How do I provide for them? So what do I need to accomplish to do that? And then from there, as I start to look at goals and accomplishing goals and things of that nature... I start to think about ultimately the, the end in mind, what am I trying to accomplish? From there, I work backward, okay, to accomplish that, here are the three or four big milestones or three or four big things along the way. And then to accomplish those, here are the littler things that I need to do. And for me, when it comes to, to goal setting, having you know, very clear timelines is important. If I can put a stake in the ground and say, okay, here's where this needs to happen, it, it helps me to work towards that. So when launching Communicast, we put, I just talked with my, my marketing director, we put a launch date out there in the future. We said, okay, this is the date that we're going to be ready mm -hmm. to have the first episode go live by. So from there, okay, okay. The goal is to have Communicast launched by, I forget what date it was in November. Kind of work back from there. What do we need to get done? Big part of that was the platform and the distribution. So I worked through there and figured out, okay, here are all the little things and then start to, to check them off along the way. And you know, with, with my work and with my schedule, I'm big on using my calendar to help hold me accountable. So yep. you know, every day I look at the account, the calendar, I'm big on blocking time. So I have on my calendar, it's color-coded. I have certain meetings that are in red that I know 
really shouldn't move. They're very challenging to move. You know, company mm-hmm. meetings, team meeting, one-on-ones with the folks on my team. Those are things I really try not to, to cancel or move uh, unless need be, because it could be disruptive for everyone. I and Personal things that are on there, I make sure I, I if I'm staying healthy, getting to the mm-hmm. doctor, exercising, all that good stuff, kids, events at school. Then I start to work through and, you know, with the podcast, those are all labeled a different color. So I know that those are coming up, what I need to do to prepare, prepare for them. And then beyond that, I will block work time. So if there's a big RFP coming up that we need to have submitted by March 1st. I'm specifically blocking time in my calendar mm-hmm. where I'm just heads down working on that. If it's time to plan for 2023, I'm blocking time in multiple weeks on my calendar to just have that shut everything down, shut the email down, shut the phone down. I likely have a notebook out where I'm just starting to get ideas out. So for me, identify what's the motivation, figure out the goal, and then really work back and then use whatever tool works best for you to be accountable and stay on track to get there. And that tool for you is a uh, uh, calendar. Yeah, for me, it just it's one of those things that that work when, when it comes to you know, goal setting productivity from a sales perspective. It's mm-hmm. it's our CRM, Salesforce.com, just making sure that you know, always having follow up tasks, make sure that mm-hmm. we're not letting clients fall through the cracks, that we're doing what we say we're going to do when we're doing it. So it really is it, it's up to the individual to understand how they work best, mm-hmm. understand maybe what some of their gaps are. I tend to be a, a procrastinator. So that's why putting the stake in the ground and saying, yeah. this is when it needs to happen by, and then putting blocks on my calendar to work towards it is what personally works for me. Awesome. And then um, for the time management, are you using any app or to-do list or anything? For me, yeah, the time management aspect is really just around that calendar to figure out yeah. where, where I need to be, what I need to be doing. I, you know, I started now, especially with Communicast, using a scheduling app that makes it easier to schedule guests on there where you know, they can see you know, mm-hmm. what's available, sends the links, all that type of stuff. So that helps to free up more of my time, saves a lot of back and forth emails right. around, are you free then? No, I'm not. So you're just finding tools to make life more efficient is always, yeah. always good. For your podcast, I'm curious, how many people are involved? I know you, you're the one who is recording on camera, mm-hmm. but video editing, uh, description, posting, uh, it's a lot of tasks. It, it definitely is. So it's uh, right now me and my marketing director. Okay. So we really work through that uh, from, you know, I handle primarily the you know, identifying and booking the guests for it. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you're doing the show and the, the prep and the recording. Uh, on the back end, I, I edit the audio and video. And then at that point is where I hand things off to her, where she's coming up and creating the marketing collateral, the messages for the social mm-hmm. media posts, the audiograms that go out, going into the platform, making sure that the episode cover art is there, the descriptions, all all that type of stuff uh, to make sure that people actually hear it. And how much time it take you to do the video editing? So for me, the video editing is relatively minor. With Communispond, YouTube has typically not been our primary method uh, from, from a social standpoint. It's been primarily LinkedIn. So I spend more time on the audio editing then I do the video editing. So for me, that's relatively small where I'm just simply cutting out on either end of the recording, just the pleasantries, you know, before okay. and after, putting in an intro, uh, intro gift that's cycling through, pulling in my audio introduction that wasn't part of the video recording or the actual podcast recording. And so that might take me 30 minutes to do, but the audio is a little bit more where I'll go back through. Once an episode's done, I'll listen to it come up with a couple key points that I want to make sure that I get out very early in the audio mm-hmm. intro. Same thing, a couple nice closing thoughts on the back end. And then I'll go through and just edit out if there are maybe a really, really long silence, or you mm-hmm. know, if, if I or a guest stumbles through something, we may pull that out. Or if yeah. you know, lots of those filler words, 
things like that is where I'll spend a lot of time trying to tweak the, the audio and getting the levels right as well. Thank you again for sharing that information. Before I ask you the last question, uh, is there a question that I did not ask, but you want to answer? Not, not that I could think of off, off the top of my head. If, you, if I just simply say for folks that are listening to this, I'm assuming they are interested in the career journey, right? You know, where did yeah. I start? Where, where am I at now? Where am I going? How did I get there? I would just say a couple pieces of advice. One, definitely focus on the communication skills. May sound a little yeah. self-serving being the leader of a communication skills training company, but they, I will tell you, I've just picked up from every guest on Communicast so far where they've talked about a training that they've gone through or a program that they've gone through or somebody who has invested in them to help them develop those skills or communication skills has really impacted their career. So I'd say definitely you, you want to focus there. The next component is really start to understand what's your motivation, what gets you, you know, really excited and what are you passionate about or what's your driving force? So for me, my family's my driving force. And so everything I do, I'm working to, to kind of build that family life at home. So that impacts and influences the decisions mm -hmm. that I make at work. It impacts the decisions on projects that I may take on or different things, whatever it may be. So understand yeah. kind of what's your, what's your North star that you're really driving towards. And the third thing that I would say, and I touched on it a little bit earlier, if you are in an individual contributor role now, and you're striving to move into to management to be a people leader, one, make sure you're going into it for the right reasons, not just for a title or you think it's okay, that's what I need to do the next rung on the ladder. Maybe I'll get paid a little bit more. Make sure you're going into it for the right reasons of helping to build other people up. And if you've realized, yes, that's me, I want to move into that next phase because I really do help, like helping people, start acting like that leader today in your own individual contributor role. Mm -hmm. you know, throughout my, my career, especially at Apollo, I would step up to serve on steering committees. I would, you know, throw things up the flagpoles. Hey, you know, here's a challenge that I'm seeing in, in, in our CRM. It takes me 12 clicks every time I want to log a phone call with a client. That's a terrible waste of time. 12 clicks times hundreds of calls per week times, times hundreds of sales reps. That's a lot of time that's wasted. Or, you know, taking opportunities as a more senior uh, sales rep at the time mm -hmm. to mentor junior sales reps. So as you're taking that initiative, whether you're asked to do it or just simply do it on your own, start right. to serve as a challenge partner, a mentor partner with other people, people will notice. And I had somebody tell me at one point, they said, you know, you're going to be moving up. We know it's going to happen. We're going to find the right opportunities because we know that you're doing the right things day in and day out, even when nobody's looking. And that's mm -hmm. what's important. So just if you focus on those things, it'll help you get, I think, to where you want to go. That's a great, great, great advice. Um, I think in this one, maybe we can also include when you're doing all this and then opportunity comes, how do you pitch it so that the person who is the decision maker believes and trusts you? I think if you've done this stuff right, they will already know. Quite mm -hmm. honestly, if, if you've proven yourself to be somebody that is not just heads down, blinders on, focus on myself, only focused on me, they see you trying to do things to make the team or the organization better, trying to do things to help your peers out, to make them better, while also delivering results for whatever position you may be in. And this mm -hmm. runs across lines. You can be a data scientist, you can be a sales rep. All right. these things are, are going to be very similar. So I think as you get there, it is, hopefully your reputation will precede you. But beyond that, if maybe if it hasn't, maybe it's a new leader moved in, they don't, they don't know you or you're new to them or vice versa. For me, it goes down to asking questions. Just like in sales, it's so important to ask questions because I could go into a meeting or an interview and think I know what they want based on just the job description. 
and start telling them all these things on my resume. And they may not care about 90% of the stuff that I told them about. But if I take the time to say, well, you know, Vinod, what are the, the three most important things you're looking for, for somebody stepping into this role? And they give me A, B, and C. Mm-hmm. I will tell you what, all of my responses are going to be tied back to one of those three things that they told me. So you start to tailor your message to exactly what they're looking for. It will help put you in the best possible position. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do you have a question for me? So what brought you to, to start this Career Journey podcast? That's a great question. That's close to my heart. So I, I really enjoy answering that. Um, so I've been doing something on my side um, throughout my life. I, I, I built an offshore center at one point, then uh, a couple of other things. And then for last year, by uh, three years, I've been writing. I was focusing on these uh, self-leadership aspect. The fulfillment I have received in my management journey is to help other and grow their career. And I've seen many people from my team uh, became a manager or some other positions which they really enjoyed. So I started accepting who I am versus pretending and projecting me being a person in the corporate Mm -hmm. setting many other people are struggling. They don't know who they are and they don't know what they want. They are on autopilot. That's when I started thinking about uh, this idea where I will create a lot of content about uh, um, the content that I've already written, content that has helped me through my journey of uh, identifying who I am, discovery, build a skill, and then know um, the high level steps that, uh, and then with the career journey, the biggest benefit that I am seeing that all the 26 people I have interviewed so far, they all have a different journey. They mm-hmm. all started somewhere, then either a person or a situation guided their path. So um, many people would say a 10th grade or, or high school or college that I don't know what I want to do. I don't know. Uh, Mm -hmm. And and my message to them through these journeys is that you don't have to decide everything on day one. You don't have to decide everything on your first job. Your job and opportunities and different people that you encounter will guide you. Um, So that's my motivation. That's that's my aspiration behind this whole thing, uh, Scott. I love love hearing that, and especially your point around finding your why, which is so important to help bring that motivation. And you touched on something as well about you know, really trying to not focus on projecting or trying to think, mm. this is who I need to be. This is how I need to come off. This is how I need to appear. Focus on who you are and where you want to go, and then fill in the blanks in between and I do think there are a lot of folks out there that are caught up in that, that, okay, I'm, I'm this age, so I should be at this point of my career by now. I should have you know this title. I should yeah. be doing this, or, or I should have checked all these boxes. And it's just, it's not the case. It, our economy and our job market has changed so much where career, the career journey is so different. There used to be this idea of the career ladder. And now they call it the career lattice, right? I may go up, I may go over, back down, kind of over this way, back up a couple of rungs and move uh-huh. all around. Some people is very linear. Other people are all over the place. And for me, it's what, what is going to work for you? What's your goal? What's your driving force, your North Star? Work towards it. And it's a marathon, not a sprint. So absolutely. Yeah. And how do you find that your, what is your North Star? Right. Yeah. yeah, for me, I mean, really everyone, it's going to be different. But for me, once once I had kids, I was just like, yep, okay. Everything I, I do now really drives towards you know the, the partnership that my wife and I have. How do mm-hmm. we make sure that we're doing the things to have ultimately you know, the life that we want to have? But for the more importantly, with our kids, our ultimate goal is to raise decent human beings. So you know, for me to doing that, then I work backwards of, okay, you know what, if 
if I'm gone all the time, I'm working and just in my office mm -hmm. 20 hours a day, it's, it's probably going to make that goal more, more challenging. So I do focus on things that I can do that accommodate the goals that we're trying to achieve for our family. Thank you. And we have one minute over. Um, my last question yes. is, what is your message to the audience? I would say my message to the audience, if you are thinking about your career journey, and I would say I hit it a little bit ago, this idea of mm -hmm. it is, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So when I was early on in my career as an individual contributor, I was just so, so ready to move into that next level, I believe for the right reasons, but by spending more time in that individual contributor role, I think I was better equipped when I moved into the people leadership role. I had a better understanding of my colleagues and what motivated them. I had the opportunity to work for a number of different leaders mm -hmm. where I picked up things that I should do, things that I'm, I realized I'm never going to do that when I have the opportunity. So you learn from, from everyone. And one of the, the guests recently on our podcast had a great expression. And he couldn't remember where it came from, but it's this idea of bloom where you are planted. Meaning that if you're in a position today where you're not thrilled about it, it's not your dream job, it's not your passion, whatever it may be. His idea was while you're there, soak up everything you can. Mm -hmm. Put those roots down, bring in all the nutrients of the people around you from the organization. If they're going to invest in you in training, this idea of bloom where you're planted, he said, I could have been in these roles and just miserable and went through the motions and really not taken much out of it. But because he was open to things, took advantage of learning opportunities, built a network mm -hmm. and helped him for his next several steps in his journey. So realize it's a marathon and take advantage yeah. of all the resources you have available to you, even if you're not in that dream job yet. Well, Scott, it was fun talking to you. Thank you so much for your time today. Absolutely. Thank you. Really enjoy the conversation. Hope you have a great evening. You too.